So we'll go ahead and begin with a second. Continue here with a second consideration during the, these three holy hours of the crucifixion of our Lord, again from the lamentations of Saint Jeremiah the prophet, which are in the holy breviary today in the in tenebrae, remembering that tenebrae, it's this matins of these days are called tenebrae, as we noted earlier. Tenebrae means darkness, and that that. This hour of darkness is, in fact, it is a sacred hour. And God chose to come into this hour of darkness. And he did say that this is your hour. This is your hour, the hour of darkness. And remember also when our Lord said these words, this is your hour. Remember that it is an hour. It's an hour. 60 minutes. The day is 24 hours. Whenever the sacred scripture in Lord Jesus Christ speaks about the darkness, it's always an hour of darkness. We're always reminded of that. But when he speaks about his day, it's always a day. This day have I begotten thee. Fathers tell us when our Lord says in the Psalms too, this day, thou art my only begotten son. This day I have begotten thee. God the Father begets God the Son in a day, not an hour. A day that is filled with light, and a day that has no beginning and no end, an eternal day. The day refers to eternity, and that's how long God is God. The hour refers to the time of the great battle, the time of the war, and it's the hour of darkness. But as I mentioned earlier, in the hour of darkness... What happens? Is it only darkness? If you go down into a cave, and they shut off the lights, when you do a tour of the Mammoth Cave, we're going to a true cave, it is true darkness. Complete darkness. This complete darkness is only found under the earth. The place underneath... So when you go down into the earth, into a cave, and you shut out the lights, there is total, total darkness. Et tenebre facte sunt is the theme of these three days of the darkness of our Holy Church. Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday. We often hear about the three days of darkness. It is good to read about the three days of darkness from the book of wisdom, chapter 17. It's not a very long chapter. Try reading it. There the Holy Ghost speaks about the three days of darkness in Egypt. Now the darkness that is under the earth is pitch black and there is no light. What is that called? I can believe from the Hebrew language. It is called hell. Hell means the place underneath. The place of darkness. Hell occurs when you are under the earth where hell is located. 4,000 miles beneath my feet and beneath all of our feet is the center of the earth. It's dark down there. (laughs) And it is the physical real location of Lucifer. He is there right now. It is the physical location of all the damned. They are there right now. And it's dark. It is total darkness. Complete darkness. You cannot see anything. 
I did always on the Mammoth Cave tour in Kentucky, the largest cave in the world. I always turn out the lights as part of the tour. You can put your fingers in front of your eyes. You can wiggle them back and forth. You cannot see anything because it is total darkness. But what about these darkness? Et tenebrae facte sunt. And it was made darkness. It was made darkness. This is the darkness of night. It is the darkness that we experience here on this earth. And when you look at this darkness, you will discover that even in this darkness, there is always a little light. In the middle of the night, there are stars. There is a light of the reflection of the moon. It is dark. And in this darkness, Christ came. But it is not the darkness of hell. That darkness is reserved for the damned. And it is reserved for Satan and his fallen angels, the devils. That darkness does not exist on this earth at any time. That total darkness does not exist. Even those that commit the great sin, one of the sins against the Holy Ghost, called the sin of despair, they are also not in total darkness. Because up until the moment of their passing to eternity, they are not really in despair. Because despair means there is no hope. Walk anywhere on this earth. Go into the most satanic place. Go wherever you wish and see if there is truly no hope. You will discover that there is a bit of lightness, a bit of light in every place that is called dark here on this earth. Total darkness exists only in hell. Now, in this lamentation of our Je Jeremiah, the great prophet, he speaks of darkness. He even says, God is going to punish everyone. He's going to punish them all. The child and the old man lie without on the ground. My virgins and my young men are fallen by the sword. Thou, that is God, hast slain them in the day of thy wrath. Thou hast killed them, and thou hast shown them no pity. This is Jeremiah speaking of God. Is that the end of the lamentation? We come forward a little bit further. And we have a prophecy from Jeremiah the prophet. In the next lamentation, and he says, Ayin, remember each letter of the alphabet, my eye is afflicted and hath not been quiet because there was no rest till the Lord regarded and looked down upon from the heavens my eye hath wasted my soul because of all the daughters of my city. My enemies have chased me and caught me like a bird without cause. My life is fallen into the pit and they have laid a stone over me. And here Jeremiah makes a prophecy. They have thrown me down into a pit and they have laid a stone over me. A very heavy stone. Guarded by soldiers. And what is going to happen? On the third day of this darkness. When all hope is surely gone. And the bishops of the Holy Church are locked up cowards in the upper room. Judas is long dead. Holy women are going to walk to a tomb. What is in the heart of these holy women? They are in the greatest of anguish that a human heart can experience. They are filled with such great sadness because Christ is dead. Christ is gone. 
there is no hope. And they are on their way to a tomb because they want to complete a burial. They want to at least put a few oils and myrrhs and aloes upon his body. You used to watch them do that in India, in the village, where they still put the myrrhs and aloes on the body. They anoint and clean the body and they take the pastes. They put them upon the body. They couldn't even do that. But they're going to at least finish the burial before he completed the case. But they discover a problem on their way to the tomb. And what those women did is what we need to do. They were on the way to the tomb when they recognized and remembered there is a heavy stone. Jeremiah talks about this stone in Lamentations 3. There is a heavy stone and they cannot lift it. There are soldiers making sure that no one is going to be able to lift it. And what do they say to each other? Who shall roll back for us the stone? Who's going to roll back the stone? And here Jeremiah speaks of that stone, speaking of the Messiah to come. My life is fallen into a pit, and they have laid a stone over me. Waters have flowed over my head. I said, I am cut off. And so this is what has happened, says Jeremiah the prophet. Waters are flowing over me. They have laid back a stone upon me. But what do you do? And here is the wisdom that God is looking for in souls today. It's the wisdom of Simon Peter. The wisdom of John. They are not yet saints. It's the wisdom of Mary Magdalene who does not understand the wisdom of Mary of Cleophas and Mary of Salome and the other Mary. But they don't believe in resurrection. They don't believe in the victory of Christ. They don't believe there is any hope. And they know no one who can remove that stone. God will allow there to be some time like this in our lives if we love him. But what's going to happen? There is a time when the mind is not enough. There is a time when a spirit must guide us. And this is the time of battle when it is at its greatest moment. St. Paul says, Caritas Christi urget nos. The charity of Christ urges us and pushes us on. When there's nothing else to push. <coughs> when all hope is lost. When no one can roll back the stone. When the cavalry is not coming. When we don't see anyone to help us, when there's no way that we can be helped in any way, what do you do? Still walk towards the tomb. Of course we don't believe. Of course we don't understand. But something makes us continue to walk. Not everyone will make that journey. We hope that we are amongst them. The first one that makes it were women. That's very important because who was the first one to make the journey away from God? He was a woman. Later came a man and he walked away from God. But the first one to walk away from God was the woman. God heals everything. So what does he do? He makes a woman walk back. You were the first to walk away from me. 
You were the first to argue with a serpent, though you were very wise. No one smarter than Eve. She had infused knowledge, no original sin. She was created immaculate. She was beautiful and wonderful in every way and most intelligent. But she was going to outsmart the devil. She was very smart, but not that smart. Very wise, but not that wise. And once she had been deceived by the devil, she took all her intelligence and she took all her gifts and she brought them to Adam in order that he might run away from God. God's going to fix that. It's one of my own great desires. I am looking for young girls who want to give their life to God, who want to be missionaries, who are ready to go to a tomb when no one can roll back a stone, who are ready to go into houses where there is no hope, where they have abandoned God, where they don't believe anymore. We need a missionary order of sisters. The traditional girls won't come. So I'm looking for girls with tattoos. <laughs> I'm looking for girls who don't know much about God. I'm looking for girls that don't understand. But who know enough to know that if that's the tomb of Jesus Christ and he's dead and he's defeated by the world and no one loves him and everyone hates him and there is no hope and they put a stone over the pit a stone that cannot be picked up and I don't know how it's going to be picked up and I don't think it can be picked up but I've got to go at least I can carry some myrrhs and aloes at least I can anoint a dead body at least I can do that we have forgotten these customs, but in all olden times, our ancestors, when anyone died, the women gathered round and they anointed the body. They cleaned the body. My first time seeing in India, seeing there the dead body and watching the women gather round. Not at the mortuary where they gut you so you don't smell the funeral home. Stick formaldehyde inside of you. Stuff cotton in your cheeks so you don't look so bad. And put some makeup on. I know that's loving, but maybe it's not that loving. I didn't do that. When I had a funeral in the village, I had 24 hours. I had to fly from Bombay or wherever I was. Go straight to that village and be there for the burial the next day. And to see those women anointing the body. with such gentleness and love, putting coins in the eyes, putting paste upon the body, cleaning it and laying it out to be buried. It's a lot better than a funeral home. And then we walk to the church with that body. And when the signal was given, they still did as they did in olden times. They wept. And then we began the ceremony. We walked with the body to the church. And walked with the body to the cemetery. Where are the women that don't believe in resurrection? But do believe in anointing bodies. Where are the women who are ready to take care of the sick, who have no hope of recovery? And not just the sick of body, but more importantly, the sick of soul, for they have abandoned God. Who shall roll back for us the stone? I don't know anyone. There's no way the stone can be rolled back. Well, let's stay home. No. They are driven to that tomb. And it's Christ that drives them. He is a magnet. He doesn't want them only to understand. 
For there was a woman that was their great grandmother, and she thought she understood everything. She was really smart. And her smarts caused Adam to sin. And her intelligence brought death to her children. We already tried the smart path. We already tried the intelligent path. Where are those who are ready to follow their hearts when there is no hope? We need an order of sisters. We need young girls to give themselves to God. They must go and visit houses where they don't know and love serve God. Well, they are alone. Why are they alone? Because they aborted their babies. Because they didn't. They divorced their husbands. They divorced their wives. Because they're living in sin. Because they're in darkness of their own creation. Is there hope for them? Oh, yes, there is. But only those who have a heart can understand. And only those that are sinners can understand. Dismas understood on this day. And these women, these wonderful women understood. They walked to the tomb. They had no hope. But they knew that St. Peter was right when he said the year and a half before, Lord, you say, are we going to leave you also? I don't understand about this precious blood. I don't understand about thy sacred body. I don't understand how I'm supposed to eat your flesh. But I do know there's nowhere else to go. To whom shall we go? Thou alone hast the words of eternal life. Now who is ready to say the words of Simon Peter when he did not understand? And who is ready to follow those women when they did not understand? Guess what? An angel was already there that morning. He rolled back the stone. A hundred soldiers couldn't stop it. They rather stood in fear as dead men. And so we continue the words of Jeremiah the prophet, which he wrote 800, 600 years before Christ was born. In his lamentation... My eye hath wasted my soul because of all the daughters of my city. My enemies have chased me and caught me like a bird without cause. My life is fallen to the pit and they have laid a stone over me as will happen to Christ 600 years later after Jeremiah wrote these words. Waters have flowed over my head and I said I am cut off. I have called upon thy name, O Lord, from the lowest pit. And here we are reminded of Jonah the prophet who called in the lowest pit. He called from the belly of the whale and the bowels of the earth in total darkness. He called from the lowest pit. Thou hast heard my voice. Turn not away thy ear from my sighs and cries. Thou drewest near in the day when I called upon thee. And thou saidst, Fear not. Thou hast judged, O Lord, the cause of my soul. Thou, the Redeemer of my life. Thou hast seen, O Lord, their iniquity against me, and judged thou my judgment. Thou hast seen all their fury and all their thoughts against me. Thou hast heard their reproach. That he spoke so much about in the previous two chapters. O Lord, and all their imaginations against me, the lips of them that rise up against me, and the devices against me all the day. Behold, they're sitting down, and they're rising up. I am their song. Thou shalt render them a recompense, O Lord, according to the works of their hands. Thou hast given them a buckler of heart, thy labor. Thou shalt persecute them in anger, and shall destroy them from under the heavens, O Lord. There is going to be a great victory, and Christ shall judge those that have warned against me. 
those who do not repent. They shall receive a recompense, but not until a stone is laid over my head, not until waters have flowed. And this is the time to walk to the tomb. So many saints have desired to see our day. As Jesus Christ himself said to those Jews who were around him, many have desired to see my day, and they have not seen it. So many saints have desired to see our days. The days in which the stone is finally lowered in front of the tomb, and the church is said to be dead, and all those the prophets are speaking foolish things, and wicked priests and wicked prophets are all around us, and the faithful are no better, for we are all filled with wickedness. You can't blame it on the priests, for they are wicked. But the faithful are also wicked, as our Lord said in Ezekiel chapter 34. He said, you shepherds, you are wicked. And halfway through the chapter he says, and you sheep. You are also wicked. You are not better than the shepherds. And so we are filled with wicked shepherds and wicked sheep. Is there any hope? It is darkness everywhere in the church. And tenebrae facte sunt. And darkness was made. Darkness was created. This is not the darkness that comes from hell itself. It is not the darkness that is created by God. It is the darkness that was made by my sins. The darkness was made by our sins. The darkness was made by our own hearts, which do not love God and have turned away from them. And what happens when you shut out God, who is the light? Well, what else happens when you shut out light? Darkness. What else can happen? But is it total darkness? Look in this night. Look for the bright light of that moon. You can walk into that light. That moon that is the reflection of the sun. That moon that is our comfort. That moon that is our Holy Mother. The Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God. Maybe the four apostles were foolish and they were cowards. And they ran away on Holy Thursday night. And they didn't believe on Good Friday. But they did one right thing. They stayed with her. And she held them up during those three days of darkness. What is darkness? It's the absence of Christ. What is light? He is the light. I am the light of the world. And during these three days of darkness, they stayed with Mary. They stayed with her. And then when he rose from the dead, they were strengthened. We are close to the resurrection when we are at the cross. We are very close to the resurrection when we are at the tomb. And we are now at that time in our holy church where it is going to rise. But there must be a death or there can be no resurrection. There must be a stone laid by your enemies and they laugh and mock and they say the words of Jeremiah the prophet. Behold, now we have seen this day. This is the day we have waited for. Now we shall swallow up her church. The church of Christ will swallow up his church. We will swallow her up. We will destroy her. This is our day. Fools. They don't get a day. Only an hour. And it passes so quickly. That's one of the reasons why our Lord Jesus Christ told that wicked priest, Judas, from Cariot, And one of the reasons why he told him, what thou must do, do quickly, because your time is out. Your hour is going to be up in a very short time, and the hour of darkness is only an hour. It is past, and there shall be a great day. Let us persevere in our fight. And if we're in darkness, and we don't understand, we don't love, we don't know what to do, And walk towards the tomb. Maybe he hasn't risen from the dead. 
But if we keep going, we'll find something wonderful that maybe we don't expect. We carry with us myrrhs and aloes to anoint the dead body. But what happens when those holy women arrive at the tomb? They left behind the myrrhs and aloes. They didn't need them after all. What they need is to spread the news. They saw an angel there, and they saw a stone rolled back. And they went to spread the news. And then what happened? Two fools that don't believe. Something sparked inside of them. One of them is called the beloved disciple whom Christ loves. And the other, Simon Peter. And they ran to the tomb. They wouldn't have run to that tomb if the women hadn't gone first. They wouldn't have run to that tomb if the woman didn't come back and tell them what they had seen. And these are women that do not understand. And women that do not believe. But they went to that tomb. And they saw a strange man. And they saw the shroud. And they saw the soldiers were gone. And they couldn't figure it out. They had no idea what had happened. And they told the apostles about what had happened. And two of them said, let's see. One was most pure and the beloved of Christ. The other one had just denied him three times. And the one that denied him three times and the beloved of Christ ran to the tomb not knowing why. Not believing in resurrection. They ran. And when they got there, wonderful things happened. So we can't always understand everything we do. We can't always understand God's ways. But we can run to a tomb. We can stay close to the reflection of his divine light, which is his holy mother. We can at least do that. And who knows? Maybe we'll be there to see Christ in a gardener. To see Christ next to the tomb. To see that folded shroud and the stone rolled back. And to understand and believe and have wonder fill our hearts. Who knows? But we do know this. There's no better place to go. There's no other place to run. There's no other place to be. Because he alone has the words of eternal life. And nobody else. And even if we don't understand what he says. Go where he is. Be next to his holy mother. Don't run away in the darkness. There's always a star somewhere. There's always the moon. There's always a light in the midst of the darkness. Look for it. And run back to the holy tomb. Be close as possible to the holy cross. And we'll be there when he rises. And you idiots, like those two disciples on the way to Emmaus. Those two foolish disciples. They heard the women speak and they saw the stone rolled back and they thought it was crazy and they decided to leave town because their hearts were too wounded and they left town. That's okay. Christ hunted them down. They saw a stranger. They didn't see Christ. They talked to a stranger all day and they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. Not one that loves him, even if he runs, will ever escape his divine love. So in the time of struggles in our hearts, in the time of struggles in our country, in the time of struggles of our world, in the time of the victory of those that wag their heads and laugh and mock, 
as it is read in the Holy Breviary today. My enemies, all the enemies have opened their mouth against thee. They have kissed, and they have gnashed with their teeth, and they have said, We will swallow her up, that is, our Holy Mother, the Church. Lo, this is the day which we have looked for, we have found it, we have seen it, and so they speak today. But what's the conclusion? And thou shalt persecute them in thy anger, and thou shalt destroy them under the heavens, O Lord. They shall not win. So let's persevere in our holy faith, even when we don't understand. There's nowhere else to go. There's nothing better than to be with Christ, even if he's on a cross. There's no place, better place to go than to Christ, even if he's dead in, in a tomb. When we go to these places, we will find wonderful things, and God will protect us, and God will make us somehow come out on the other side in the day of victory. Close it, close it, bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Now we'll have the Stations of the Cross, and then at 3 o'clock will be the Mass of the Pre-Sanctified. So we'll go ahead and close the prayer, and then with the Stations.